Today we're going to talk about a relatively new technology, which is the uh, fenestrated stent graft repair of uh, complex aortic aneurysms. Next slide. So just a brief uh, overview about uh, aneurysm repair. So why do we fix them? Well, uh, the main reason is to prevent the risk of rupture. And uh, as we know, rupture of an aneurysm is bad. You know, the way I think about it is 50% of people who rupture never make it to the hospital. And of the 50% that do, 60% die despite intervention. So obviously prevention is key. So uh, traditionally, this is a traditional stent graft repair of a inferino abdominal aortic aneurysm. And it's been proven over and over again that uh, the perioperative morbidity and mortality of endovascular repair is superior to that of conventional open repair. And, you know, you can imagine that the open annual resmectomy is uh, one of the bigger operations that we do. So anything you can do in a minimally invasive fashion while achieving the same long-term outcomes is actually better for the patient. So the key, a few principles of uh, endovascular aneurysm repair I want to stress here is that the key here is that you're deploying a stent graft uh, that you expect to seal to the aortic wall here. And the idea is that you prevent any uh, blood from getting from the aortic lumen out to the aneurysm sac. And when you can do that, when you ex can exclude that aneurysm sac, then you depressurize the sac and thereby you protect the patient from rupture. And so that's, <clears throat> that's the basic principle. Obviously there's a lot more details such as the distal seal and you know, side branches, but the most common reason why people get excluded from endovascular repair of aortic aneurysms is that proximal neck. This distance here from the renal artery down to the top of the aneurysm has to be a certain size so that the stent graft can adequately oppose to the aortic wall to prevent leakage around the graft. Next. So if you, there's a study that was done that looked at how adequate uh, patients who are, who are considered for aneurysm repair, how ad adequate that proximal neck is. As it turns out, in the old graphs, the indi indi indications for use say that the uh, proximal neck length should be at least 15 millimeters. And in this study, you can see that most people actually don't fit that criteria. Now, the various stent graphs have sought to um, shorten that neck length by employing a variety of different techniques, and there's been a couple of new graphs on the market that try to shorten the neck length that's required for endovascular repair. But the fact remains that the majority of people do not fit within that 15 millimeter proximal neck length. Uh, next slide. So, so these are just, uh, uh, there's two papers here that basically talked about the inadequacies of uh, um, uh, that the patients, really most of the patients don't have an adequate proximal <coughs> neck length. And that, again, that's the most common reason why people are excluded from endovascular repair. Next slide. Next one. And as the shorter the neck, next slide, uh, the shorter the neck, the higher the risk of endoleak. And what endoleak is defined as is the ability of the blood to get around the stent graft into the aneurysm sac. And therefore, any type of leak that's from the proximal portion of the stent graft, uh, you basically are not protecting the patient from rupture. Okay, next slide. And next slide. And so, you know, in this paper it talked about how, what, you know, each millimeter matter in that proximal neck length for each short uh, millimeter of proximal neck less than 17 millimeters, the risk of endoleak uh, goes up significantly. Next slide. So, today this is what I'm gonna focus on. Uh, I'm sure that um, you'll have other uh, opportunities to talk about the newer stent grafts that are on the market these days. But today I'm going to talk about the fenestrated stent graft. And what this was designed for was to try to address the issue of that short proximal neck. And the idea here is that if we can extend that proximal neck to as far as we can so that we can achieve an adequate seal, then we decrease the risk of a type 1 endoleak, which is the leakage around the top of the graft. And thereby more patients can undergo and endovascular repair, which in theory conveys a lower morbidity and mortality. And so what a fenestrated stent graft is, is that uh, it has custom-made holes, and each of these stent grafts are individually designed based on the patient in question's um, anatomy. And they're eventually designed with holes that are matching the orifices of the visceral arteries of the patient, so the renal artery and the superior mesenteric artery. Next one. And so by doing that, you can, you can see that by advancing that seal zone above the visceral arteries, then you can achieve a better, the longer the neck length, the, the better the seal. Next slide. 
And uh, this is uh, pretty common of uh, most uh, endo endographs these days, that they're all modular components so that you can uh, maximize the number of patients that can undergo uh, repair using the smallest number of different components. So these are complicated cases and uh, you know, certainly the cases that I've done and been a part of have involved two surgeons. And you can see this slide is just to show you that there's a lot of metal in that patient. I mean, it's, uh, there's wires everywhere and it's just hard to even just keep track of, the, of all the devices that are in the patient. So these are complex repairs and, um, but this is what Dr. Ghani was talking about is that technology advanced, has advanced and imaging has advanced to the point that we are able to do these things now in a safe fashion. Next slide. So I wanted to uh, present a case and um, uh, this case is uh, special to me because this is the first one that we did at Danbury and uh, just to give you an idea, she's uh, 64, oxygen dependent COPD, AFib, Coumadin, uh, she's 5'7 and 350 pounds. So, you know, it's, uh, it's a perfect candidate for open repair, but just for kicks. So you can see this is an animation of um, uh, her uh, pre stent angiogram. Go ahead and play it one more time. So this is the top of the aneurysm here and you can see that it's the top of the aneurysm basically goes right up to the renal arteries. So uh, uh, it, traditionally this is required open surgical repair. Next slide. Go ahead and play the video. And so this is what it looks like afterwards. You know, so you can see that the aneurysms well excluded, the renal arteries are white, nicely patent. And um, next slide. So this is a, a, a computer reconstruction of what the anagraft is theoretically looks like. So you have the stent graft that goes way above the renal arteries. You have individual stents to the renal arteries. And then you have this uh, conventional uh, inf infrarenal configuration down there. And so this, this woman uh, underwent the repair and she walked out of the hospital two days later. So that's the difference that new technology can make uh, for our patients, okay? I'll uh, go ahead and skip, click a couple more times. So this is just my last slide, and it just shows that, you know, technical success, and obviously you have to go through a lot of training to do this, but technical success is very good in, in experienced hands. And um, it, uh, the, as with most, the downside has been argued for endovascular interventions is that there is need for future interventions. Um, and it in significant portions of these patients, 80% of them here in the last slide, they, has re they have required reintervention to keep the renal artery stents patent and the visceral artery stents patent. But I would take a two day recovery over probably what's most likely for her would have been at least a two month recovery for, uh, to, in order to protect her from rupture. Okay.